Good afternoon. Hope you're uh, having a good afternoon and very glad that you could join us this afternoon for this session with the Children's Media Foundation. Um, my name is Mark Goodchild. I'm an independent creator, producer, digital product specialist. I've been around the block a bit. Um, worked across kids media industry for the past two decades, notably at the BBC, Warner Media, and with various independent production companies. Um, we're here today to find out some of the latest research that's been conducted by Kids Know Best for the Children's Media Foundation as part of their ongoing review about the benefits and importance of public service media for kids. We've also got a panel of luminaries who will help us unpack some of these insights, notably uh, Jaffa Asher from uh, Director of Polarity Reversal, he'll join us shortly, Warren Nettleford, who is the founder of, uh, of Need to Know, and Dr. Jane O'Connor, who is a reader in childhood studies at Birmingham City University. Uh, the reason we picked them is because they've been involved in this, sorry, wrong way around, there you go. Oh, it's the same both sides, um, which is a meaty anthology of perspectives on public service media for kids from the great and the good. It was compiled and produced by the Children's Media Foundation last year. Um, and it was the first step in a sort of a three phase piece of work that's been going on. Um, one of the big themes that came out last year was that any debate around the pros and cons of public service media for kids needs to take on board the views of that audience themselves, who typically don't have much of a voice in the corridors of power. So CMF is here to give them that voice. And last year, the CMF started a round of research. The first phase was conducted by uh, Dubit and was looking at the issues that matter to kids. Um, and then I would urge you to go and have a look at that. That's really interesting about the things that they say are important to them. And this is round two, uh, looking specifically around how 12 to 14 year olds perceive their viewing, their behaviours, their preferences, etc. I think we'll be able to extrapolate a little bit about some of their younger audiences, uh, partly because they're much closer to the sevens and eight year olds than we are. Um, but we'll be looking at it through the lens of 12 to 14s. Um, and it's obviously a really critical time uh, for public service in general in the UK at the moment, because the BBC have been, as we know, have been asked to take a hit on license fee increases. Channel 4 is potentially up for sale. We've got the Young Audiences Fund is coming to a close. And at the same time, we're hearing lots of noise from the streamers about uh, personnel changes in the kids uh, divisions at places like Netflix, reduction in spend uh, on originals at YouTube, um, and we've also got all the safety issues which are coming up um, in the uh, uh, Not For Harms bill that's coming out. So lots to talk about, but today is primarily about seeing it through the view of kids and what are the issues that matter to them and their behaviours. So first of all, I'm going to introduce Rebecca and Katie from Kids Know Best, who are going to go through a presentation. We'll have a look at it. They'll answer some immediate questions from that, and then I'll bring in our panel. So over to you, uh, Katie and Rebecca. Hi there, uh, thanks so much, Mark. Um, yeah, so I'm Rebecca um, and this is Katie. Um, I'm the research director at Kids Know Best and Katie's our research exec. Um, but just a kind of brief introduction to Kids Know Best. So we're a um, creative and research agency, um, predominantly focusing on kids and family. Um, at kid, like, uh, the research side of it, um, we do a kind of lot of focus on listening to children um, and kind of just having chats with them and understanding what's important to them before we start addressing objectives and assumptions. So when um, Greg and kind of the rest of CMF kind of came to us um, and like addressed this topic and started talking about kind of, you know, just listening to what kids were thinking about and what they were watching and having like these kind of conversations with them, um, it was a really nice project for us to be involved with. Um, so I will hand over to Katie to um, yeah, briefly explain how we approach the, the, the project in the start of this. Um, and then we've got a short video to show um, before we kind of go into any more insights. So you can move on to the next slide. Um, this is actually just some initial quotes that came out that we like to kind of kick off with a few thought pieces of what's to come. Um, so I'll just read one of them, but there was a really nice girl, um, 14. When we were younger, um, we were a lot less busy after school. They'd get home every night. Um, and there'd be an episode of The Next Step. Um, I'd sit down at that time and watch it while I had my tea. So just a little bit of an insight into the kind of things that we'll be talking about. 
Okay, now I'm going to hand over to Katie. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. So if I think if you could just go back onto the next four, we'll have a look at the methodology and the sample that we used. Like we said before, the chosen sample, we had 12 to 14 year olds because we thought um, this age group, reflecting on the work that we'd done before, there's the biggest gap in terms of the content that is on pu public services. Um, and then they can also reflect on the things that they used to watch when they were seven to 11 years old. Um, so they've got that experience there that we can ask them about. And thinking about how things have changed from, from the age of seven to 11, it won't have changed that drastically in terms of what they're um, engaging with. Um, so the sample, we had four families from around the UK, four different regions, backgrounds, ethnicities, and genders. So we tried to get, um, we had to, uh, sibling duos and then a mix of gender and age so it was 12 to 14 like we said and um you know they were confident speaking in front of the camera they wanted to you know share their opinions on this topic so we would say that this wasn't a a, a nat rep sample of families in the uk um because they do have those opinions on you know how they're engaging with svod live tv um but they have different opinions so we, we had some families that were coming to us saying we've got rid of our tv some families who are you know, watching everything and anything under the sun, but they they all had opinions that they wanted to share. So what we did was we took took eight questions for them to answer in their home, which is what the video we're going to share with you now um, shows. And then we followed up with some interviews in the home to ask them more questions about what they said. So we'll go on to the next slide and we'll show you that video. Um, my favourite TV show is Strictly Come Dancing and I really like it because I like getting to see like my favourite celebrities and watch how they get better and better. I like watching Britain's Got Talent because there's lots of different kinds of people that do it and I like seeing all their different unique abilities. We like watching live TV as a family because like, it's quite easy to watch and for all the families to watch together. And I really like watching Sam and Cat and The Fundament and any like Nickelodeon programmes. One, it's really entertaining and two, it's kind of like an escapism. Riverdale, because it's got mystery and horror and romance in one. The Flash, um, because it talks a lot about science and there's a lot of action in it. My favourite TV show is Stranger Things because it like has a sense of when you finish the first episode, it kind of drags you into watch, want to watch the next episode, and it keeps going like that. I watch things on like Catch Up on BBC iPlayer, and for when programs on when like we're at school and things. We watch some live like together, all together, but mostly by myself. I watch. Like streaming services like Netflix and Amazon. You can watch it on any device yeah. whenever you are. And you can then. take your pick on what you want to watch. Every now and then I'll watch like the football. Thing. Yeah, like, or if I can't find something to watch, I might just like look through the channels if there's anything that interests me just to pop. In like the evenings after school, um, Saturday and Sunday mornings because there's no school. Maybe on the weekends there's like a family activity. And it's majority of the time like weekend nights because obviously we don't have to worry about being up early for school and stuff. Live TV is quite nice because sometimes they interact with you. Yeah, like, and you get that feeling of being included. Yeah, because like, as an like, audience. Whereas on catch up, sometimes people have already watched it before you, and so you can't really have those talks and you don't get to be as involved. I think if you watch stuff on demand, it's better because you can forward them and or rewind them, pause them, and stuff like that. On demand is like if you want to watch a certain thing and then you uh, you can just easily find it. Whereas if you're just browsing through channels and looking for something on there, it's very unreliable to find something that you'd be interested in because um, obviously they only have a certain time and a certain day that some shows get played family and then sometimes I'll watch programs and then talk about it with my friends afterwards as well. Yeah, I watch a lot of things with my friends because then it, like you can talk about it and be like oh what's going on. Yeah you can discuss it with them. I've done it online on Netflix fighting. I'll either watch it uh, alone or with family. Mostly with family because sometimes at the end of the day during the evening before we're about to go to sleep we just like cool off the day with like uh, watching like The Chase or watching uh, World's Greatest Fools or You've Been Framed. Just something that we can all enjoy as a family, mm -hmm. including the little kids. I think 
if it's like a live show, then I prefer to watch it with others because it's like you can like comment on dances and who do you like best. Whereas if it's a series, it's on demand, then everyone's going to be at different stages, so I prefer to watch it by myself. Riverdale and Sam romance movies, I definitely prefer watching alone. I feel like it's nice to have something that is just for you. Just having that time alone and thinking that your show is really nice. I prefer watching The Flash with others. In a way, it's nice to have a talk about it with someone who understands what's going on. But if there's one and the only hour that's going to be there about makeup or something like that, like based on stuff I like, I know it's not the best topic to um, watch with everybody else. So on BBC, we saw there's no adverts. On Netflix, there aren't any adverts. However, on Netflix, you do have to pay monthly. I think BBC is a lot more serious and some channels like that are quite more probably aimed at like adults. If you say you're turning on BBC, I'd expect the news. Um, I think from a BBC channel you expect more like um, like nature, things like Blue Planet or like uh, wildlife and Rose the Beast, that kind of stuff. On Netflix you can have ones for adults or you can have children's TV programmes or there's always a suitable age range whereas BBC, you don't really have an option because they just put something on for you. Um, I expect there to be more option for kids on Netflix and more of a uh, range. Go on Instagram, watch YouTube videos and try and work out different links to things and really look into it and find like hidden gems and stuff in the program afterwards. I follow them, all the cast members on Instagram and TikTok and stuff. Yeah, see what they're getting up to. Yeah, because it, it kind of feels like you know them once you've watched them in the show for so long. Yeah, I look with the, what other shows the actors have done. I'll see if they're creating a new season. Um, most of the time, if it's something I love, I'll just go and rewatch it straight away. So we are just going to pull out um, kind of four key takeaways. Um, I think a lot of that stuff, like listening to what the children were saying and how they were kind of interacting, some of the stuff wasn't particularly like new news um, and potentially for some of the, our audience today, um, but it would be good to kind of unpack what those things were said. Um, after these video clips were made um, kind of at home, we then recontacted the families and had interviews with them. Um, so we kind of asked the questions of like, why, why did you say that? What does that mean? Um, and then later on, we'll use these key takeaways to also discuss with the rest of the panels and the wider group um, and open up to kind of questions and answers so we can also um, kind of yeah, keep, keep unpacking it with everyone today. Um, the first point that we kind of pulled out here was kids are more invested in shows that are watched on demand platforms. Now, this was from kind of a collective of what people said, um, but also through um, kind of experience of speaking to other children um, on other occasions. There's, again, what, the, what they were saying on, on the video, there's no adverts, there's ease of access, there's choice of every episode whenever um, when, and they can watch it whenever they want and wherever they want. Um, like they reference kind of like putting it on your iPad and taking it in the car for journeys, um, which means that if they're hooked and want to kind of watch next episode, next episode, next episode, they really can. Um, one of the boys mentioned on the um, video that the reason why he liked Stranger Things, he didn't pull out anything from the actual show or the characters or the storyline. It was because it hooked you into watching the next one straight away and he could and it just ran through it. Um, I feel like that's something that we see kind of time and time again um, when it comes to kind of investment in shows that are predominantly on um, demand. Katie, do you have anything to add with that kind of unpacking this statement? Yeah, I think again, like you just said, in terms of um, it's that being drawn into the to the show and the ability to binge watch. And it's something that... Um, you know, you can take your iPad up or your laptop up and sit in your room and watch it for hours. And it's just that, you know, the ease of access and having that show for yourself, your favourite show being at your fingertips at all times. Mm. And I think, again, we did see it highlighted in the video um, that particularly on demand shows, um, children and kind of young people are watching by themselves, or, uh, like, you know, like Katie kind of mentioned, up in the bedroom, under their duvet, having like alone time and it almost being like a kind of, 
part of what defines them and what's kind of like building their character and their opinions and their identities because they're interested in these shows um, and it's something that they can kind of sit and watch alone um, as well as then knowing that their friends are maybe watching it alone and then they'll come together later and talk about it maybe in school or whatnot. Um, okay, on to the next point. So this kind of leads on from what we were talking about um, with on-demand platforms, kids are searching for more content relating to their favorite shows. Um, now, this is a really interesting point. And again, I don't think this is potentially new news to anyone um, that we're talking with today, but kids love to go and hunt for more information. They want background stories. They want hidden gems. They want conspiracy theories. They connect with the actors and then follow the actors in person and follow their actual kind of like the work that they're doing, they follow their lives on Instagram, um, they kind of buy into their characters and then buy into the humans as well. Um, so there's this constant kind of search for, for more information. They go to places like YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. Um, and it's something that's really interesting is this obviously is not um, particular for kind of TV live channels um, or on demand. This is obviously stimulated by all content and all shows and um, wherever they're watching it but interestingly from watching live channels um if you're connecting with a, a show that is on live channels um and you are still waiting kind of week by week or day by day to kind of get the next series anything that they are investing in and they are kind of getting really hooked in it still pushes them onto on demand type platforms because immediately they've watched their show they've watched their episode and they're going on to tiktok they're going on to youtube they're going on to places online on demand that they can find more information um so it feels like even when you know it's stemmed from a tv show that they're they're loving and watching on um on live channels that's that kind of like want for more information is still pushing them into kind of on demand platforms yeah um, yeah and i think that the content that they're reaching for it tends to be like you said on youtube it may be that they're watching an interview about the film or the show that they just watched their favorite actor in and then they're, they're following you know what are they going to be in next where can i find it is pushing them on to to on demand and svod um but you know they're definitely searching for things and you know in terms of things that are on live tv if it is young actors that they really engage with so a couple of them did mention in the video there about Stranger Things being one of their favorite shows and the actors in that show are you know a similar age they they follow them on Instagram they're really invested in their lives and it's something that they you know they really want to follow what they're doing um and you know an interest in those kind of shows if it was on live tv they would definitely definitely be turning it on and, and you know watching along. Mm. Yeah I think and, and that's like quite a key point to make is that it's kind of relatable content for them Mm -hmm. um, and we did ask this question. So Katie, you did kind of ask the question to them afterwards. Like it feels like the, their, their favorite shows do predominantly sit on on demand, but if they were taken off on demand and put onto a kind of live channel and they had to kind of, you know, tune in at Tuesday to seven o'clock because they knew that was when it was playing because it's their favorite content, they would still go and watch it. Mm -hmm. Um, and if they knew that it was available on Tuesday, they would still go to their live channels um, and find it. Um, so it is important about you know of finding the right content um and that's a kind of whole other a topic in itself kind of searching for content mm -hmm. um we'll go on to the next slide so this is just um actually kind of a um a scenario of what we were kind of talking about this just then um so actually looking at the kind of fanatomy and building the engagement it's really interesting when you see um shows that have done this well and for, for using an example that's not on demand and using an example that's on live tv strictly come dancing does do this really well because they did have tiktok channels they do have their instagram channels you really get invested in the dancers and then they follow and then you follow the dancers as individuals um, and that was something that what some of the children were talking about so this is a, a Sonic the Hedgehog um, example, how they've kind of got touch points across all different platforms. Um, but this is exactly the same kind of in practice for content. So you would have had like Strictly Calm Dancing live on TV. And then you've got the kind of like YouTube dance videos that where um, some of the like professional dancers are teaching them different exercises. And then you've got the TikToks where you can follow the um, dance practices and their sessions. And you've got the like dance partners messing around and doing different interviews and challenges. Um, so there's this whole kind of like world of connectivity, um, which is nice to hear that like Trinity Gun Dancing, for example, was um, highlighted as, as very like good at doing this. Um, so yeah, if we go on to the next one. 
So kids watched live TV when they were young, but now they feel like there is no content that appeals to their age group. Um, so this in particular came out um, with reflecting on whether they used to watch live TV. Um, so because of the age that they're at, there obviously was a time where um, they were kind of at the age of about seven and there was still, um, you know, if I reflect on my life when I was really young, obviously YouTube didn't exist, but for these kids, they did. Um, and actually when you reflect, when they do reflect on their younger years, um, they, they the reams of TV shows that were live channel shows um, that came out were endless, weren't they, Katie? It's like they had their favourite shows that were live TV channel shows. Um, they really reflected on the fact that there was, that like their age group at that time was served by live TV. But now at the moment, um, they're not. And it's very much when they're trying to search for new shows and they're looking for ways to kind of find new programmes, um, being on demand is just where they're catered for most. Um, in the video, we obviously saw the children talking about um, how also on like kind of Netflix, for example, it's really clear what age ranges there are. It's really obvious what is content for adults, what's content for children, what's cartoon, what's movies. And obviously that's a lot harder to find um, on the kind of live TV channels. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add to Katie. We had, Katie, you had some really nice conversations about um, how they searched for content as well, um, which is really interesting. Yeah, and I think we'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, but just on this point, I think it's, it's again, it's all about perceptions and what they think about live TV channels. And like they said in the video, they think about, you know, about the BBC, it's it's news, it's antiques, it's moving to the countryside. There's a lot of stuff there, but it's just not for me. Um, and thinking back to what we just said about um, really relating to content you see, having, you know, shows about things that are relatable. So I know when I was a teenager, I loved to watch Waterloo Road. So obviously a, sh a show that's set in a school with kids your age, it's just more engaging for them. It's the sort of stuff they'd like to see. Um, and, you know, we'll move on to this in a, in, a, in a second, but the things that they are really liking is the the big Saturday night programs um but there's no kind of dramas or series that are drawing them in like with Stranger Things having a cliffhanger or that kind of drama yeah it is interesting to hear that they they do feel kind of like underserved by channels at the moment that are kind of live channels yeah um, and if we go on to the final point um however live tv is mainly used for watching kind of these showstopper Saturday night programs and there is a kind of real family get together feel. We were met, obviously we mentioned the way that like they kind of go up to their room. There's the option to kind of do Netflix parties, but it's still quite virtual um, and you're still essentially kind of sitting by yourself or the tendency to actually watch programs alone. With live TV, it's a completely different kind of ball game. Um, it's very much centered around family time, finding programs um, like the, the boy mentioned on the video that actually is suitable for kind of mum, dad and the little children and him. Um, it's mostly watched at weekends. Um, most people that we do speak to and the children in the videos so that it's very centered around kind of like having that Saturday night or Saturday mornings when you're not worried about school, you're not thinking about school homework and things like that. Um, they also said that live TV tends to be better um, watched with others. So very much getting involved in different competitions, um, Strictly Come Dancing, um, Britain's Got Talent. You sit and you discuss with the group live what's going on, what's their performance. They've all got opinions. You're kind of like judging them. Um, and it's those types of shows that perform really well that kids can kind of list off. Mm -hmm. And I think as well with like, um, it's not even necessarily who's in the room and you're watching it with. I think that is a big thing about having the family there, but it's also thinking about live TV and as things are happening at that moment, you might just be texting your friend or, you know, interacting with people as things are happening and it feels current. And then again, you can go on to content elsewhere and you've just watched Britain's Got Talent and you've seen an amazing performance from somebody and then you'll go off and find more about them. And it's just of being in the moment. And I think they did really, you know, they did like that and they like watching things live as they're happening. Um, so there's kind of on demand and live TV are really serving different purposes um, mm -hmm. from what we've heard. Yeah. And I think that's not something to be a problem. I think that's something to be leveraged essentially. It's just actually getting the right content on the TV, like the live TV channels that then will kind of play into this um, kind of like, yeah, different purposes. Um, 
But yeah, I think that's essentially it from us for the moment. Um, and we'll hopefully kind of revisit these points and discuss further with the rest of the panel a bit later. Thank you so much, Katie and Rebecca. That's been really good, really insight, lots of insight there. And I'm sure there's lots of things we'll, we'll come back to. Um, I'm going to, uh, we'll go through some questions specifically in a minute, but I'm just gonna now uh, introduce each of our guests one by one, um, just to get their thoughts on kids media as a whole and a lot uh, particularly around what they contributed earlier in the years to, to this document. Uh, first of all, uh, Jaffet uh, Asher uh, from uh, Polarity Reversal. Uh, Jaffet, tell us about where you're coming from, your views around how uh, children's media has been evolving um, where you think it needs to go for public service media in, before we get into the actual sort of the, the detail of what sure. we've heard? Well, obviously, that's a very broad question. Um, but um, I'll start with what I wrote about in the Children's uh, Media Foundation report, um, because, um, well, Mark, you and I worked together at the BBC in children's content for a number of years. Um, and back then, we thought about lean forward and lean back in terms of the experience of interactive content versus television content. Um, and it, it, what we developed over that time in giving kids more of a say in the way they interacted with media, we built a lean in generation who expects to interact and expect to engage. Um, and uh, in particular, I applied that thinking to the BBC and its license fee issues um, and the sense of ownership over how things are spent um, and having a kind of Kickstarter approach to um, the, um, the choices that commissioners make and getting more engaged in the editorial aspects of what they watch. Um, and I think this is particularly true for teenagers who don't feel that they're seeing what they want to see um, and ought to have more of a voice in the choices of what's available to them. Um, I think that will result in the same kind of thing we're seeing at the tail of shows where kids are excited about um, the content they've seen, the celebrities that they've engaged with, uh, the discussions they've had around it, they want to go deeper. Well, that can happen at the front as well, especially when a project is uh, interesting, engaging to them and has uh, performers or uh, celebrities, actors, uh, storylines that excite them. They're going to want to know more about it. They're going to feel more engaged in it and they're going to become advocates for it. So I think that's that was very much the point of the piece that public service media has a great opportunity to trust its audience the same way that we ask the audience to trust public service media. Um, and, you know, a lot of what we've just seen in the research suggests that that's a possibility. Yeah, I definitely heard a lot about this sort of polarity about the binging and stuff for me versus the, the drive to live, which we sort of grew up with about Saturday night being the place where you actually then share with the people in the house whereas the yeah. stuff you do offline. Hold those thoughts, because we'll come back to some of that when we start asking the questions, I think. Sure. Um, Katie, uh, I'd like to, uh, like to bring you in. Uh, sorry, Jane, I'd like to bring you in next on the um, looking at... I know this audience is particularly the 12 to 14s, but your area of interest has been actually about how these behaviours are already changing with that younger audience. Do you want to yeah. talk about what you wrote about? Yes, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, I mean, it, our research is um, focusing on preschool age children. So the very youngest um, sort of demographic, really, who have historically been sort of left out of media research because, you know, they were sort of seen too young to make their own choices and, and didn't, didn't sort of have agency there. Um, but what we're finding uh, with three to five year olds and our, our research is particularly about how they engage with YouTube and YouTube kids. Um, is that they are very sophisticated viewers. They're very discerning. Uh, they're very much in charge of what they want to watch. They know what they enjoy. They're able to articulate that. Um, and they're able to direct um, what, what they want to watch. Um, and so that the, the research that I uh, wrote about in the, in the report um, was looking at, um, we use some child-centered methodologies to try and get behind young children's eyes when they're watching YouTube kids to actually understand um, from their perspective uh, what that means to them and, and their understanding of it. Um, and um, we allowed them to sort of um, show us what they were watching and talk through it, talk aloud. 
um, and, and sort of range us through the sort of um, content that they like to watch and, and sort of uh, let them lead that. And then we also showed all of them um, the same episode from Ryan's World, which is a toy review um, child vlogger, micro celebrity, and asked them specific questions about their understanding of, of who that child is and whether he was real or, you know, so to try and explore if they understood the kind of constructed nature um, of, of reality that is presented in these videos. Um, and, and, you know, it was it was really fascinating. I mean, the, the very younger children, sort of three to four year olds, perhaps took it at face value. But the older children, and I say older and I mean five, um, were able to say, well, he does it for money, you know, and the, you know, the, the toys aren't his. And that they were they were they were understanding um, already uh, that that sort of, um, you know, commercialized and, and constructed nature of, of the of the stuff that they were watching. Um, but what, what we found really important was um, the opportunity to talk to young children about what they're watching on YouTube Kids, because I think the tendency is to sort of leave them in the corner with their tablet and just kind of let them get on with it. And especially if it's YouTube Kids, it's just like, well, that's safe, so that's fine. I think it's really important that we always that we continue those conversations with young children, um, because I think a lot of them are choosing to watch on their own on you on their tablets rather than watching. Um, you know, live stream CBBS or CITV, but even children five years older were probably watching it at preschool age. It's a different kind of interaction with media, um, and, and I think it's something that that needs to be explored further. So definitely something I think we should come back to is that you know we talked about live TV versus the streamers, but there's this extra platform, massive platform, YouTube, which is sort of almost in, in, seems to be filling a different place. For the, the older kids but possibly also for the younger kids let's yeah let's have a look with, YouTube, at... with youtube kids parents sort of see that as a safe place it's yeah. almost like what cbb's was to the generation before brilliant thank you and then warren um if we can bring you up on screen great um so warren you had a slightly different approach you're looking at this more through the eyes of where young people get their their news and media yeah, that's right. So I'm the co-founder of Need to Know, and um, we created a, a, a news service primarily targeted at um, children 14 years and upwards. Um, it was quite interesting just hearing some of that research because um, the, the concept of shared experiences was something which they spoke about quite a few times. And what we found is um, in the past, um, people have mentioned news round as being really influential in terms of watching the news and, and learning about what the news is. Because I would say younger people aren't having those kind of shared experiences anymore of watching the news with their parents every day. They're not really, I would say, getting a, a full kind of holistic diet of what broadcast content is. Um, because they're not really getting in the habit of seeing the news every day. And so we've gone to YouTube now, just started uh, having been on Snapchat previously and getting um, 2 million viewers in a very short period of time. We've just moved over to YouTube in the last few weeks um, because it's a, it's a platform which young people choose to spend their time on. And for us, we think it's just hugely important that young people get to understand that what's going on in the world around them and that we create news content that's easily digestible they can comment on, they can share about. Um, the uh, researchers now just mentioned how young people are just so desperate to kind of find things out, follow things up, check out more research. And with Need to Know, we're just trying to fill that void and, and start something new. Thank you for that, Warren. Um, we're going to now open it up to questions from our panel, but I'd also ask that if you've got questions and you're watching at home or in your garden office like me, um, that you uh, start putting them in the Q&A um, and Greg and team will be having a look at those and uh, prom prompting me when we've got some questions to ask. Um, we mentioned quite, quite a few times this report. Um, you can find this on the CMF uh, website. Uh, plus, you can also find the Dubbit research uh, and the other events around this series. And I'll read this out. So you've got it. So it's www.thechildrensmediafoundation.org. And then it's public service uh, media report. Please do have a look at that. It's free. You can take it and have a look and, and you know, really digest some of these ideas. There's lots of other ideas in there. Um, I want to now bring it open to some of the questions that we came out. I think, Jaffet, you sort of were particularly looking at this sort of difference between 
media is something you sit back and consume and, and how kids and young people actively engage in their media. And certainly something I took away from that report was that they tend to be treating both live TV and the streaming services as almost something, the library that I go to to find my favorite stuff and have a binge session or uh, something that I can have a slightly secret, no parent over shoulder viewing session. Um, but then going to other platforms to actively engage and have that community, that chat with their colleague, their friends, their tribe, whatever. And what you're saying is that we sort of want, is there an opportunity to actually have that more as a, as a feedback loop? Questions from you about what you heard. Is there anything that sort of uh, surprised you or that you yeah. want to find out more from? Uh, okay, well, so forgive me if I sound a bit pedantic. I, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with the live TV versus on demand. Um, this definition we seem to be using. I mean, there's broadcast television, there are channels that play shows in a schedule, and then there is live TV, which is an event to me. And one of the things that seemed apparent in this is that people were responding to event television um, where something seemed to be or was unfolding live or the results were announced live. And so they would miss out if they weren't part of it. And that was where a strength lay. But, you know, we know that a lot of kids are uh, in this age group are also consuming live TV, as we might call it, as I'm calling it, on the streaming, uh, uh, you know, on Insta and on uh, YouTube. Um, I'm sure Warren knows lots about this. And in fact, um, it's that ability to engage and participate and feel part of what's happening as it's unfolding, which is powerful in all these places. Um, so it's one of the things that strikes me. Um, we don't do that in public service media for a teen audience, unless you think that uh, Glastonbury once a year is that. Um, and, and so there's an opportunity there. Um, I also reckon that, um, uh, so, so something that I'd like to know more about from uh, Katie and Rebecca is about how we could use the feedback loop of this deeper engagement with celebrities on other platforms that they've seen in shows that they do enjoy in public service media to help bring them back to public service media, which is something I care a great deal about. Um, and I'm thinking here about, you know, curating playlists of favorite shows. Um, you know, I, I remember years ago talking about this at the BBC and having been kind of poo-pooed about it, but it always seems to me that influencers and their choices, people you look up to and what they engage with, is one of the key things that kids are really interested in. Like, so like it's Spotify. Actually, it's a, like Spotify, does Yeah, it? for yeah. example. Yeah. yeah. So, it's so, so let's, bring, let, let, let's bring in Katie and, and Rebecca. This, you know, a good distinction, live events... Yeah. They aren't particularly necessarily about television. Linear is what I think Jaffa means. It's a scheduled mm. television that we knew and loved when we grew up on and then on demand. Did you get much out of the, or the this panel about where they're going for these live events? It's not all television. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely not just television. Um, and as you mentioned, Instagram, TikTok. TikTok lives are obviously huge. Um, and it is about connecting with, and if we, as we're talking about TV shows in particular, it's about connecting with the actors. It's really about understanding like beyond what they are um, in the character. So, you know, then that you can kind of follow the day of the life of, you know, your favorite character that would actually see what they're doing in their real life or what season they're now working on and when they're going to come back to like your shows. I think, um, Jaff, it's your point about how we kind of bring them back. Katie had a really interesting chat with um, some girls the other day, and they were saying that if I just knew that there was more TV shows that I wanted to see and when they were on, on the platforms that I'm on, so Instagram, TikTok, I would go to them. And I'd be, if, you know, if my favorite influencer or my actor that I follow is telling me that they're on a show and it's on, gonna be on Tuesday at seven o'clock, I will go and watch it. But at the moment, it's I have to go to the TV guide to find out when everything's on or obviously Google TV guides. And I think so, and it was her point that she made. There needs to be more prompts to go back to the TV, and more prompts to let them know um, that I'm in a TV show and it's going to be on BBC One or, you know, whatever channel it is on that's um, on this kind of like linear channels and to push them back into it. And they weren't... A, averse to that as well again to your point like it wasn't uncool to get pushed back onto the kind of channels 
um it was just something they didn't know they didn't have enough information about I don't, I don't know Katie did you have anything to add to that um yeah I think in terms of pushing them back onto the linear channels it's again going back to the, the the point we made that there isn't the content isn't there or you know if it is there they're not aware of it so if you are getting the content that they want to see and it's got the actors you know in the shows that they mm. want to be in the shows and then the actors or you know wherever on instagram on youtube are promoting it and they're engaging with the content they're absolutely going to go to the linear channels to the yeah. bbc tuesday at nine o'clock and they're going to watch it live um as it's happening so yeah sorry can i just ask because it's i mean you're not talking about iplay here you're not talking about all four you're not talking about any of the on-demand services mm, that yeah. the public service media channels have and it was really surprising to me to hear the kids saying well the bbc turned it on it's got news on rather mm. than talking about well i go on iplayer and sure they might go on iplayer and think they couldn't find anything that was for them but there's a lot more content there yeah. um and and then, the, but that's interesting I and mean, they, they don't even really associate at this point with on demand yeah i mean they, def they definitely did bring up um on demand you know in terms of iplayer a couple of times and there was one example of um one family as a family they really enjoyed watching um what's it citizen khan and that was something that they all enjoyed and they would just go back and watch it and they know that it's there but obviously if you're not aware of the show and the fact that it's on that platform then you know mm. it's easy to go and find it if you you know what you're looking for so yeah because they're not using it on a day-to-day -day -day basis yeah okay. but, it, but it was striking that they talked about netflix having kids content but iPlayer didn't have yeah. kids this content. This is it. When we asked them what was the difference between, you know, BBC and Netflix and things like that, it, we could have had a child that was, you know, trying to kind of outsmart the question and be like, well, they've got an iPlayer, they're not that different. You can go in and search. That was obviously the answer that we might like them to hear and say, but they didn't. It wasn't what they thought about when they initiate, like, you know, they initially started thinking about BBC, Channel 4, whatever it might be. I'm going to bring in a question from Nikki Stearman, who's on the, on the Q and A. Um, related, I think, do twelve to fourteen year olds care more about the content or the platform con the content is on, or do they, you know, are they thinking I'm going to TikTok, I'm going to YouTube first, and then go now I'm going to look for, for the people I'm after, or are they going? Do they are they equal importance, or are they thinking I want to find my strictly uh, star that I'm following and then work out what platform they're on. I will initially start and then I think Katie can kind of jump in afterwards, but I think it's down to the purpose that they're going for. Again, there's a, there's a purpose behind what they're doing. So if they're wanting to kind of, like you said, binge watch a series or look for a new series, they go onto Netflix. Um, if they know that they want to watch interviews with their favorite actor that they've just seen, TikTok is a really great space for that. It's very naturalistic, kind of like on the go type content. If they're then looking for slightly more, um, I think one of the girls um, that we spoke to referenced kind of hidden gems, you know, when you can find hidden gems and like going into the next one or conspiracy theories, that links to slightly more longer content on YouTube. It's very much a purpose of where you're going. Again, like the kind of community chats that you get with hidden gems, Instagram and um, TikTok, you can kind of go down rabbit holes. So I think it's really about the purpose that they're they're going there for and that they're looking for. And ju just to follow up on that, so something like Netflix, which does actually have now their own to them uh, website. Any kids mentioning that? Because that's where they're trying to corral all this stuff. Um, me, no, Katie. No, I'm like, not aware of that. <laughs> no. It's interesting. It's not the platforms where they're, they're necessarily looking. Good. Well, uh, final question for Jaffet. One of your ideas is around this. Can we allow kids to have more say in what gets commissioned? How, yeah. you know, is there something you, is there anything from what you heard that you were sort of desperate to ask the question or? Well, I don't know about specifically about that because I think kids, um, you know, we know that they've got opinions about what they watch. This business of seeking things out and going down rabbit holes. If they knew there were a place where they could explore, I would assume that they would go there. I'm just not sure that how do you get past the barrier mm -hmm. of, well, they're really not exploring on um, the on-demand services of the public service uh, media now because so, so there's an awareness issue 
Um, and I wonder whether there's anything in their thinking that might suggest that. I mean, the other place where there's a lot of live and interactive content is Twitch, of course. And I, you know, but people know that that's, that started out as a gamer environment and now has all kinds of content on it. Um, and you vote with your feet. I mean, it's pretty obvious what's getting traction. And so, you know, I, I guess it's less a question than a, a, a thought about whether kids are, how aware they are that their eyeballs are votes in a sense um, in those contexts. And I'd add to that something like Reddit, where you can upvote stuff. You know, are there did there, any conversations from kids about actually how they're taking that conversation a bit further and you know trying to trying to influence the? Um... Yeah, Mark, that's true. And I think one of the things that I also wanted to think about a bit was, you know, we talk a lot about these this generation of being creator content curator content consumers, um, and you know, platforms like Snapchat and TikTok are really enabling that. Um, so how did we harness that more? Was that something that came up in the conversations at all? Um, uh, or was it all around the social and the research side of interaction with their favorite things? Mm. In, like, so I'll kind of kick off. Interestingly, a lot of the, the conversations that I kind of witnessed were very like, we would love to have more influence. We would have loved to have more say, but never really told us beyond the fact of wanting it um mm -hmm. and i think that really does add to your kind of and strengthen your point about awareness um if if there was a place that was you know near near to where these kind of like social media hubs are that they already are um that they could have an influence and have an opinion and like you said kind of beyond just the fact that their eyeballs are a vote um they would go there they they express mm -hmm. that they just couldn't there was from my point of view, there was no one that went beyond, oh, well, do you know what? Actually, this is what I would like to be able to do to make an influence. There, was, there wasn't there was anything like that. I mean, Katie, have you got, I don't know if you had any different experiences. Yeah, no, it wasn't. I don't think they were kind of, in terms of content creating as well, I don't think there was anything that came up organically with that. Um, I guess going back to like, you know, having a say in what they'd like to see, just there were a couple of opinions of, you know, if if something was to be, on a linear channel or on you know like on iPlay or anything like that that you would want to go and find they just were talking about things that were you know more for teens um things like I mean even thinking about like book adaptations things like that that are you know you could even look at book sales of you know what are teens reading these days and create content in that way and engage them in that way and like we said before um putting it onto platforms and they they then will naturally become content creators if they are engaged with something so yeah, I think a lot a lot of the conversation, the only conversations that we had around like influence was the fact that they wanted stuff that resonated with them, mm -hmm. stuff that they saw themselves in. Um, but yeah, so actual, we, like logistics of giving influence on what gets made was not yeah. suggested. Yeah, well, you, and you wouldn't expect them to have an answer to that, but you know, it's about giving them an opportunity. We, I was part of the, the, the vote that allowed uh, um, kids across the UK to pick the Blue Pizza presenter. Um, Lindsay mm -hmm. uh, uh, back uh, I think it's 2013, 2014 um, and, and you know that's proper empowerment in terms of uh, yeah. engagement so it's not something that hasn't existed but it's something that these kids have grown up with yeah. and uh, yeah yeah but no I think when this is something we, if we have time we'll come back to this later on I'm going to bring in Jane in a second I think one of the other sort of observations though on that these kids having influence on what they're being, what's being served to them was that nearly every one of those titles, apart from the big Saturday night shows, was not British. So, you know, maybe they're not seeing the media that they're getting as the place where they see their own stories reflected. And therefore, you know, I doubt they expect to be able to influence how Stranger Things is going to evolve or The Flash, et cetera. Was, is that something I've done? Is that just because of what got called out? Or were most of the titles um, American drama so I got Sam and Cats, uh, Thundermans, Riverdale, Flash, Stranger Things. Mm. Yeah mentioned Gilmore Girls a lot yeah it was a real mix. I, I think That's it. interesting isn't it that, yeah you know the stuff that reflects their lives isn't actually necessarily yeah either they're not finding it or it's not pulling them in. Mm -hmm. um, Jane can we coming to you you know I know you're looking at this from the younger perspective but 
with with the research that you've done, have you were there any things that sort of came out of you uh, at you from that research about going, okay, okay, yes, that's that's almost I uh, directly uh correlates to what we're seeing with younger kids or something that's pulling in a different direction? I think there's definitely similarities and I can see, you know, the, the trends towards what's attractive to, to young children to watch is kind of translated in, in, in a slightly different way for the older children. So, for example, in terms of children's choice of, of viewing on, on YouTube kids, we found that something funny, that was their main thing, something that's related to their interests. So somebody doing, you know, something crafty or something with animals that they particularly liked. Um, and also they, they really like that um, micro celebrities, which is what, what we call the, the child vloggers. So the children, you know, obviously, you know, now we have young children as consumers and producers of digital content, which is something new in, in the media landscape. And it means that very young children have that high level connection to children of their age, um, you know, uh, un, unwrapping toys or doing some sort of play or that, that they can that they can engage with. And, and that's really exciting to them. Um, obviously, there isn't the sort of drama programs or whatever on YouTube kids, not, not the ones that that those weren't the ones that the children shared with us in our research, although obviously there are. But those child influencers, are, are those, again, mostly American, or are they, they looking for kids like them? Because it's one thing we hear a lot from child development experts about how important it is to see people from your own culture, uh, mm -hmm. your own language, your own society. But they tend to be American, um, yeah, the ones because they lot. they show that real aspirational lifestyle. You know, it's almost like a perfect version of childhood where you know they've got all the toys and everybody around them is happy and they get to go to Disneyland and and you know it's all obviously um, you know commercialized. What I suppose the concern is that the children don't get that. You know, they sort of think that that is that child's real life, and mm. then that can kind of distort their expectations around their own life. Um, although, so, as I say, in the in the older um, children in our, in our sample did get that, but the younger ones obviously have no idea about that. And I think there, there is an issue around that. And just the other thing I was going to say that I think is a difference between the older children and the younger children is that, especially when we were sitting with the children and they were sort of showing us the sort of thing, you know, as they watched, um, they, they tend not to watch a programme from start to finish. They just jump. As soon as they're bored, they just jump onto something else. And I think for very young children who've got quite short concentration spans that's a, that's becoming very typical in the way that they watch television or or any kind of video content um they, they don't uh, you know i think they find it very it's very hard to sit through a film for example yeah. or or even like an hour long or even a 20 minute long if they're getting bored with it they just jump onto something else mm -hmm. and they've got that opportunity and they've got that freedom and i think that that's something new for children that young and I, and I think that that might have a knock-on effect to how a lot, you know, whether they'll be still doing the kind of binge watching series when they're older, yeah. or whether it will just be kind of like little bite sizes of this, that, and the other fitting in around. I, I think I think there's there's a possibility that that could change with with this generation. We we actually found really interesting. Sorry, I'll jump in because it's not necessarily related to kind of like whether TV on demand or kind of live channels, but it was something that came up in conversation that we've seen in our in this age bracket, so the 12 to 15s, they all have it with subtitles on. And so does Katie, actually, <laughs> funny enough. But they all have it with subtitles on, not because it, they're watching it in another language, because they don't, The um, one girl said that it was because she doesn't pay attention enough. And so it's easy for her to just read through the words sometimes when it's up and when she's looking. Um, and it's very much, it's well, and then her parent was also in the room and her mum was like, by the way, this is weird. No one does this. It's a generational thing. Like, we don't do this. Like, as parents, we've never done that. Why on earth would we be watching subtitles in our own language? Uh, but, it, but all of their friends do. All of that generation do. And it's something that is, um, must be related to this attention. Like, the, uh, you know, just, I think it's also it's not the fact they can't attend to it the whole time. It's the fact they don't want to. It's not, you know, it's not a priority. So having subtitles on the whole time. Um, it's just a, a way, another way of kind of like making sure you don't miss a bit. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring in Caroline Kaysen's comment from Ofcom. The latest Ofcom core research amongst, among children media live reflects that point about short attention mm -hmm. spans. They don't want to sit and watch full episode or a movie. 
they want to jump across devices, screens and content, multi-screening their content so they don't miss out on anything. The question, I suppose, which we can't answer here is, you know, does this set a behaviour for life or is this mm -hmm. something, you know, it's, it's like the old Radio 4 argument, no one will listen to Radio 4 in the future, but actually people do seem to grow into it. So it'd be interesting to take that. The, the other question, which I think you, we talked about beforehand, Jane, particularly with that younger audience, there's a lot of, still there's that parental mediation about how much time you get with the screen, et cetera. What we heard from those 12 to 14s, it's sort of, it's about their independence, surely, you know, that, and they're taking their devices and they're doing it in their own time. If, I think you had a question around how much are parents really control or setting limits on how much, what they're watching, whether it's on, on the streamers, whether it's on, um like linear tv or even on um you know the, the other services yeah i mean I, I was interested in that um rebecca if, if if anything came out in your research about the, yeah about exactly that what do do parents still set limits in terms of either time screen time or on kind of appropriate content for 12 to 14 year olds or did they in your study so i mean i'll i'll hand to um katie in a moment but from, from our point of view, kids did not mention that. Um, and just from existing kind of research and knowledge, um, not necessarily on restrictions, but on um, influence of what they're watching, it's very much a family decision. I think COVID played a bit of a part in that, the fact that there was a, you know, a need to be uh, negotiating together, not you know, the, actually having like parts to say in what they're watching. Um, so there's very much that negotiating happening around the families and children are having more and more of a say that's being listened to in general across a lot of, we're seeing it across a lot of industries, not just kind of TV choice channels. Um, it's, but also even the types of um, services that they sign up to. Um, so whether that's kind of like a Disney Plus or a Netflix, it's a very much a family decision um, that kind of parents are listening to the children about. I didn't personally hear much about restrictions with this age. Mm. Um, I know that there are restrictions with young children, obviously, um, that parents do enforce, but there, there's a lot more conversations around like, it's my mum's device, it's my mum's account, it's my mum's this, or I know that I have my mum's account on Netflix, but it's the child account that I have to log into. There wasn't any of that kind of conversation from our point of view um, on the 12 to 15s. I don't know if, Katie, you, you have anything else to kind of add to that? Yeah, no, I think I agree with everything you said. I think, you know, they get a lot more independence with this age. Again, like we were saying earlier, they'll take their device up to their room. They'll sit and watch whatever they want. But a lot of the stuff on there is, you know, it's mostly appropriate that they're watching. And they, they're looking for things that are, like we said, relatable and things they want to see, mm. things their friends are talking about at school. Um I will say there's one, a piece of research I've done recently um, with, with Jane, the, the age group you're looking at. So it's kind of two to five year olds and parents saying to me that in terms of the content, you know, a lot, a lot of kids will find these things themselves and they'll find their own tastes. And there's a lot of um, things like, you know, like superheroes or like Spider-Man and PJ Masks, that kind of stuff, which isn't necessarily... Um, violent but kind of has nods towards violence compared to shows that are more nursery rhymes and education and, and parents thinking you know I'd rather my two-year-old watch this kind of stuff but they're really wanting to watch Spider-Man and and not being able to control that necessarily and the kids actually having a lot of say in what they enjoy watching even from such a young age. Mm. Um, I think really siblings have a have a big role in that as yeah. well I think if young children have older siblings it becomes incredibly hard to control yeah. what they're watching. That's very interesting. And I, that, that point about um, subtitles, that we had a comment from Jean or Jean Buchanan um, came through to the panellists, which was, does it mean that they're actually improving their reading skills? And I know there's been quite a bit of work by people like Sky, et cetera, about this campaign to try and get sub subtitles more available so that kids are benefiting from it. Um, let's park that for a moment. Um, I want to bring in Warren the uh, you know this this idea that kids are taking their devices particularly this 12 to 14 group and you know disappearing to their room and going down rabbit holes and watching stuff presumably that's an area for you you know it's, if that's the place where they're, they're consuming and having that pull um pulling finding that new information that's where new where their understanding of news and media literacy where they're going for that information becomes quite important have you got some thoughts or questions on that yeah i've got some thoughts i mean um 
There's a question as well from Caroline from Ofcom when she was asking about <clears throat> in the old days after school, um, you know, with PSB content, you'd go there to get your fix, but how do young people go about doing that now? And that ties in quite neatly. And also, as well as that, young people are seen as being not being interested in news, which isn't true. So there's some research, I think Ofcom did it in the last 18 months, which says that actually young people, and this is 16 to 24 year olds, I think, only watch around two minutes of TV news every day, compared to if you're over 65, you watch more than 30 minutes. Now that's just TV news, but young people are still interested. And I think as well as that in the same report, and also the government's Cairn Cross review, there was this sense that young people aren't being catered for, they think the news is currently too boring, it's not catering to their needs, they want to find out about the world, but no one's really doing, doing the work really to make sure that young people can, can be catered to. And I think there's a, a fundamental question, a bigger one in terms of what kind of society we want when it comes to public service media, because Going back to the old days of everyone having three or four channels and you, between the, between three, between 345, was it? And 545, um, you know, parents would know they could trust the BBC and ITV um, to provide good content, which would be educating them about the world and giving them a bit of entertainment too. And then parents would have the choice as, as to whether or not they let them watch Neighbours or not, or maybe that's my parents. That was the world as it was. But now what's happened since then is, We've kind of deregulated the idea of this attention where it's a free for all, where any what children go anywhere to get this information and no one's really taking responsibility. The social network providers aren't, the government have got a hands-off approach, the, the broadcasters, because it's so difficult to appeal to younger people on these social media channels because they're competing with Hollywood studios, they're competing with Netflix, everybody else. It's, an, it's so difficult. So in the same way that there was regulation before with three channels where we were like saying, okay, well, young people can only watch this kind of content at this time. Why isn't there a big question now being asked in terms of how the social media networks work and what young people are allowed to watch? And it's I'd add to that, I think Caroline's, the last bit of Caroline's point, which was in, you know, in the old days of linear TV, we used to hammock between those entertainment things, we'd make sure you got your 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 your, uh, yeah. your um, you know ten minutes of of news round. That changed. Those were those were conversations which went on between Ofcom and the BBC, I believe. Um, uh, Katie and Rebecca, any anything that you've you've sort of heard from the audience about where are they? getting the, the this news? We heard from the Dubit research that actually these issues are really important to them they care about it's not like this is an uh, this is a generation who don't care they care about this stuff mm. but it sounds you know from warren's research as well it's just not being presented in the right places at the right times in the right ways what what can you share with us mm. i mean so particularly from this panel because we were talking about kind of like television and kind of like searching online and the view that we've all kind of spoken about uh, that the, the news is there in on like kind of television um, and TV channels, but it's just not appropriate for them. It's not the tone of voice for them. They don't resonate with it anymore. Um, and we didn't explore as much into kind of like, um, you know, how do they find, you know, where are they going um, as such into like finding their news and discussing it. However, with previous research, um, we know, and I, I think like personally, I can say quite worryingly that it is TikTok. It is like homemade videos. It is things, people having conversations on kind of different communities. Um, and even like Discord being ones where, you know, it might not necessarily be, um, you know, a news channel type Discord, but they're talking about these subjects because they want to talk about it. As you said, they do care. Um, they really do have opinions on these things. And I know from, if you do like kind of get to the younger ages, um, they're very good at articulating what they've already heard. Um, so it's very easy to have a kind of conversation with a child about political things, social things, environmental things. And they're very good at articulating what they've heard. Um, and I think if they're, and that's, you know, obviously okay, that's allowed. You're, that's how you form opinions and you test opinions. Um, but if that's not being done in the right environments, and I guess that's where it can be, you know, quite dangerous and quite, you know, it can it's quite... Um, yeah, it's not very it's not very good for the, the general conversation and how they're learning about these things. So that's the kind of general consensus that we've found. Well, maybe, maybe this is an area we, we'll talk to CMF about whether there's more research. You know, last question on this area. 
are you getting the sense from that audience that they are actually struggling to to differentiate between disinformation and and you know verified information because once you go into the you know the world the the the, the uh, wild west of it it's you know adults have hard enough time dis mm. dis distinguishing distinguishing the good from the bad mm. um it's you know certainly right now with the war going on we, you, you hear quite a lot of things about how the platforms are being lobbied to actually do more uh, validation and verification um, mm. is that something you heard and warren you know do chime in if you if it's something you're hearing as well i mean just from just from my quick point i think it was over two years ago now, just over two years ago that we did a study um, around this. So if anything, there's been a lot more to talk about and a lot more things that are kind of slightly confusing and difficult conversations to have um, and follow. Um, children, we spoke to children, um, similar age, 12 to 15. And the one thing that they brought up was the pressure to understand, the pressure to react and the pressure to be able to have these conversations. So things like um, when Black Lives Matter was happening and it was the um, Instagram black square and there was the pressure to retweet that, re like, reshare that, have a voice, have an opinion on these things because they know it's important and the worry of not knowing what is legitimate um, information and what's not. And it, there was a, and that was a kind of a key thing that they um, stressed us about just having that pressure on them of like, being able to have these conversations um, and not, yeah, and kind of like knowing what's right and what's wrong. Um, I don't know if that kind of... No, no, very useful. I see Caroline from Ofcom has also come back the same sort of, you know, they, they tend to get most of their information from social media rather than traditional sources. However, they don't necessarily trust what they see on social media. That's mm. a good thing, but they, and they do trust what they see on the likes of the BBC. However, they just aren't watching it as it's seen as boring, miserable, et cetera. And then that's the dilemma we need to fix. That's almost exactly what you were saying, Warren. You know, the, the, yeah. the, the, the presentation is just missing a trick. Yeah, exactly right. And um, that was one of the reasons why when we started doing what we do, we decided to, even though we technically don't need to or don't have to because we're online, we've been following the Ofcom code in terms of impartiality and fairness and balance, just because when it comes to trust, yeah. They trust the BBC and ITN, Sky. So we wanted to kind of emulate and do the same thing. Now, of course, there are bigger questions in terms of can that still work online in the future and who knows? But I think that's a really important point um, just to try and um, get young people to know that they can trust some um, new services online which are also speaking to them in the language which they understand and which they can relate to is really key. When it comes to disinformation, um, we actually did an episode on that only a few days ago uh, because it's something which young people, which we've seen commenting on, it's a really big topic. They're not sure what's right, what's not. When an influencer shares something, should they really trust it? Um, when it comes from a celebrity, is that news? What, 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 is, what even is news? And it's that idea of um, news literacy, really, which I think is a, is a fundamental problem, um, which um, the major broadcasters, because it's so difficult to go online, um, and they're you know, starting to do it more now, um, run down at, IT, at ITN, they're doing some stuff there too, which is quite good. Um, I think there's this real kind of gap where there's a need for the younger generation to be informed as to what news is and what they can trust and what they shouldn't trust and, and how to go about deciphering all of that. No, that's really useful. I, I, I think this should be something we'll talk to the CMF about whether this can be incorporated in the next level of research. Um, I want to come on to uh, another question from Harvard Christensen. It's something, sort of something that was occurred to me, and I know we talked about it previously. You know, we talked a lot about video behaviors shifting. So <coughs> where are you what where are kids spending, young people spending their time watching video? Is it are they moving to doing it more on demand? Are they going to the bedroom, et cetera? But overall, are there is video te or television as we knew it becoming less important? It's almost like background and ambient at times because they can do, they can be much more connected with their friends and uh, socialize playing a game or interacting on a, on a messenger uh, portal. You know, again, the, re the replacement for the telephone when you got home from school. I think from, so what we've been seeing, it's a tricky question because as you mentioned, it's not that they've stopped watching television to start playing games. They do it at the same time. <laughs> um, so it's hard. It's quite hard to comment on like if they're actually kind of 
doing one less because they're doing more of the others. Um, I think it is just this like key um, link and interaction between um, if you can go on Netflix and you can watch a series or it, even if it's on live channels and then you can connect on TikTok and you can then connect with other people that are part of a community that look for hidden gems on Discord and then you can um, share your own experiences on Instagram or, uh, or Twitch. It's about having that connectivity. If you can have all of that and let's say like, you know, Strange Things is a brand in itself. If that brand is present in that kind of and what, you know, what we reference is like the metaverse type thing. I don't think it's that one suffering because they're doing more gaming. It's the, it's the fact that you can in, involve them all and they can engage with Stranger Things on Roblox or Twitch or whatever the channels they're preferencing. Um, I was and, struck though, there were a few comments that they did, there were certain things they didn't want to, you know, that there was a problem with on demand because they could be out of sync with their friends and then for, couldn't talk about it. And mm. then one person mentioned about viewing parties. Was that, you know, was that a, a rare activity that you get on a viewing party with your friends or is it the, the asynchronous nature of the fact that we're all watching the same series but at different time zones now becoming a real challenge for having that sort of cohesive mm. moment? I think, um, do you think, so what, what I got from, from this panel that we spoke to was that um, lockdown was the real kind of um, catalyst, if you, if you will, for really going on demand and really actually then going and finding things on demand. And I would assume that actually the kind of Netflix party and the, you know, on Disney, you can play at the same time, that kind of thing. That probably happened more so then. Now that they're back in school and back chatting to their friends, I think that, um, you know, they can they can do it in real life or it's it's more watching things on your own um or for yourself on on demand um yeah I don't know if you would agree Rebecca yeah I think Netflix parties for example are happening less um mm -hmm. but they're I mean they're definitely still present and it wasn't it's not like that the girl that mentioned it in the video she's definitely not the first person person that's talked about it um and continue to talk about it I think you're to your point it is about being able to share stuff in real time together. And that is why kind of like the live TV channels do do well. Um, and in the same instance that they like the kind of Disney plus, like sharing the share watching and, and the Netflix parties, um, the fear of missing out or the fear of not of like getting a spoiler and someone being in front of you or, you know, someone then watching two extra episodes, even though they said they wouldn't, um, that is a real thing. That is, it's a real conversation. It's real arguments. <laughs> um, and that, that comes up as a kind of like counterpart um, as much. Yeah. I think you mentioned Gilmore Girls. I think I've seen in the sort of streaming league tables that Grey's Anatomy, you know, is, is mm. right up there again. People going right back to the very first series. Mm. Um, that's, it's sort of, it's giving us a shared topic or you know to talk about but you just can't get into the detail with it with your mates because you're 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 on different you're mm. on a different timeline that that seems to be almost like a bit of a problem for the streaming or the on-demand world that we're actually you know the, the things that games do brilliantly is allow us to connect in real time at the same time streaming seems to be pushing us down to those solo moments in 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 the bedroom you know when when the siblings are creating too much noise downstairs, et cetera. Yeah. And I think as well with those shows, Gilmore Girls, Grey's Anatomy, they're the kind of things that um, the, these kids were talking about them as kind of comfort shows. So if they couldn't find, you know, they're like browsing on, I don't know, Netflix to find something new and they've been browsing for five, 10 minutes and they think, oh, do you know what? I can't find anything. I'm going to go back to that show because I know I love it. They'll pick a programme, season two, episode four, um, you know, because I know I like that episode and I'm going to watch it and I'm just going to turn off and, and wind down. And it's that kind of thing for yourself um, to disengage from kind of everything else, I think. It's been brilliant. Well, thank, go on, Jaffe. I just, I'm just curious about context because we keep talking about, I mean, all of these things are about the context in which kids are consuming stuff, right? Um, and I find it really interesting. Um, and I think it's true of the news context. It's true of the specifics of when they're watching, what they're watching on their own. Um, so, you know, when we think about uh, public service media, it comes back again to the idea of how we create a context that fits the kids' lives. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of know that that means taking the content 
out into the world um, and how do we accomplish that in the right way so that they, the touch points are there for them, um, you know, and, and give them the ability to interact with it in the way. I mean, Mark, just to embarrass you, you did that great climate champions project at Warner Media, which was done with CNN and was done in a way that created a huge volume of news and information, but in the context of giving kids the chance to get involved. This is in a generation that's that are advocates. The Black Lives Matter comment that you made earlier was really interesting. Um, we all know um, that this is a generation that rightfully are really engaged with the climate crisis. So contexts in which they can engage allow them to consume content in a new way, in a trusted way. And I think there's an opportunity there, which perhaps should be grasped by particularly the BBC, but public service media more broadly. Um, I don't want to undermine Warren's great initiative, but wouldn't it be great if news around a news beat were the world service of news for kids on YouTube? Why shouldn't they be? We know that they do great work and they're trusted. Maybe Warren will do it instead. That's great. But it needs to be done. Or partner. Um, or partner. Or partner. There you go. Um, that would be great. And I think it's grabbing those opportunities that will make the difference. Um, so, you know, I think the context point that keeps coming up is really important. I just really wanted to underline it. No, and that, that's brilliant, uh, Jaffa. I think, you know, we're, we're coming close to the end now. I see a question from Nikki Stearman. If you were a commissioner for 12 to 14, what would you commission and why? I'm going to slightly extend that. What, you know, not necessarily what content would you commission, but what what product or service or, um, you know, uh, might you commission going to um, you, Jaffet, because I know you've got some thoughts. What would be, where would you put your money if you were a, a rich controller? I'd ask the kids what they wanted to watch. I think I've made that pretty mm. clear already. Um, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't put starters for 10 out there. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that um, uh, one of the things we get wrong all the time, and I know this from... Um, you know, I made a lot of content for MTV in the 1990s. We think everything's new, but it isn't. And the reality is that MTV back then was mainly watched by 10-year-old girls. It wasn't meant for 10-year-old girls. Mm. So we have to speak to our audience about what they want to watch um, and engage with them in that way. Um, I'm not going to give a commissioning brief. I think that's a bit <laughs> presumptuous. <laughs> Jane, come, coming to you, what would you, I know I know you're particularly keen on that younger audience, but sort of yeah. extrapolating it up, what would be your wish? I, I, obviously, I, I can only echo about it's so important to listen to children. Um, I think from my perspective, from my research, if children are going to watch a longer programme, the things that seem to be appealing to them are things like Floor is Lava, is this cake, oh you know, th th this is almost like the modern version of it's a knockout, you know, it's the kind of adults behaving in a childish way that's kind of engaging them in, in, in the kind of narrative of, of, of a programme around a kind of quite wholesome concept. Um, so in terms of kind of getting them off the kind of very short concentration span, which I suppose is my concern in terms of, of children's cognitive development, you know, and the idea of watching with a family, I think we've got to think really, really carefully about how we're going to, you know, include the youngest children in those family viewing, um, you know, experiences going forward, because I think they're going to be very, very hard to, to, in, to include in that. They're going to be, I think they're getting into the habit of having their own sort of, you know, choices on their own tablets very, very young. And I, and I think, you know, the sort of the emotional and social benefits of watching as a family might be lost unless we can sort of find find ways that that, that we can meet their needs as well as older children and adults as well it's very very tricky um but you know looking at the sort of things they like we have to listen to what they like warren it's always bad when you're repeating everybody else um but i just say i listen to what the kids wanted um, and then because I'm coming from a news background, um, I'd be thinking of trying to explain a big issue in a way that was very, very understandable to a broad range. And I think the way I've been trying to sell what we're trying to do is it's a bit like thinking of a, a Pixar film. You want to create news content which the parents can watch and understand and what young people can be engaged with at the same time. So it's the holy grail. That's what I'd pitch. Great. And coming to you, Rebecca and Katie, because obviously you're the one who's been you've been talking to the kids, uh, young people, hearing their what their 
sort of desperate for or what they feel is missing, what would be the things that you would take away and going, ah, this is what we should be doing? I'll let Katie go first. I feel like I even know what Katie's going to say. <laughs> so I don't dare steal your idea. <laughs> I've already kind of said it before, but it's, it's again, those things that are relatable to them, the things that they love, um, you know, people, yeah, people they relate to, storylines they relate to. Um, you know, I think, I think, Jeff, that you're right in saying they need to have a voice and an opinion on these things. I don't necessarily think you need to go out there and ask them. You can just look at what they're doing and what they're engaging with. Um, like again like I mentioned before there was a girl who said I'm really into reading books uh, there's one book she mentioned she was really interested in that a film was coming out for it there's just those those things that you can look at and, and see what they're really loving and yeah get their opinions on, on that that is fascinating like the rise of book talk as you know the way young people are now finding book recommendations I think is is almost you know says something about why has television why isn't television the place where they they're getting that, you know. So there is something about the immediacy and the proximity of, of some of these platforms and the more, re how, why they see it's more relevant to their direct lives, which maybe we need to look at. Um, it's a peer, Mark. I mean, that's what's going on there. Um, you know, book talk and bookstagram. I mean, as you know, I work in publishing digital primarily now, and it's all about peer to peer, and that's the power of it. Mm -hmm. Rebecca? Oh, and the last one, and I'm kind of just going to repeat everyone else. <laughs> it, re it really is, isn't it? Just like seeing seeing their lives. And I think what you just said there about the proximity, maybe that's just something that the like TV channels have, have lost over the years is that proximity. Katie obviously mentioned like, well, I don't know if you actually did mention this conversation, but you mentioned every other conversation about Waterloo Road. <laughs> and I was also one of those people that loved Waterloo Road. And I think it's just having stuff like that where... It's, it, you know, and it's a bit like um, observational comedy, isn't it? Where you, you really connect with it because you, you get it and you understand it. Um, and it's that kind of thing where it just brings, you know, the proximity closer. It brings, it brings what you're watching closer to home and, and closer to what you connect with, which is exactly what TikTok and Instagram does, obviously, when they watch, um, watch their favourite um, influencers. But I think particularly TikTok, it's content driven, not necessarily influencer driven, which means that the, the content that you are watching is the closest to what you could be doing because it's a boy or a girl or whoever it is and a dog and a cat in the kitchen with their mum or dad or brother and sister running around in the background while they're making TikTok videos. It's very, very like, that's my home um, and that's what I'm watching, so yeah. And I know you do a lot of research into the influencers at Kids Know Best. Do you see that there's more, I suppose, homegrown, the, the, the British kids are following more homegrown talent on those platforms than they are necessarily of the dramas that we've talked about. So I, and something I saw in YouTube many years ago was that actually a lot of the influencers are, you know, those micro influencers who are specific to a particular audience and generation in a specific country. Is mm. that the same with TikTok or is it becoming globalised? Yeah, it's a tough one. I think it's on TikTok, especially because it is content driven, not influence driven. It can be a little bit more globalized and you will get videos that someone's made in Canada. And if it's gone viral, it's gone viral and it will, it will reach you. Um, I think. Um, yeah, I, it's, it is. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think you the interesting point, I, I mean, I feel like it's a bit of a contradiction to what I've just said. But what Jane was talking about as well with American um, influencers, something that we've been really looking at um, within like our influencer team and actually how we work on campaigns is what is the performance of bringing American voices and American faces that they they know, they love, they follow um, and just having them, you know, interact with British um products you know you know in like videos clips or whatever it is because that's what they're used to seeing and it's like what it's still very very american driven what they what they do see um so yeah it that's like that was essentially a reference to a more younger age range but it is it, it yeah i feel like i did just contradict myself but it's very it's very tricky <laughs> so, so lots of food for thought i think mm. there uh we're running out of time a few last minute comments that I've seen that they're coming in through two different channels. Um, Yuval um, has talked about, uh, there's a news for young adults on Instagram um, in Israel made by 18 year old. 
um, which is interesting. I think there's all there's been a question about why we've been focusing so much on the older audience uh, coming from Vicky. Um, we should invite them to the table far more often to listen to them, so we can create uh, for and for them and not at them. Mm. You know, I think that's what the part of this research is about. It's not it's not meant to be completely restrictive. We have to start somewhere, and then. Um, the final message really from, from Greg and Joe who've been organizing uh, this event is please subscribe if, uh, to the Children's Media Foundation newsletter if, if any of this has been of interest. Mm -hmm. This is ongoing research. So there are more opportunities, A, to have your say uh, and, and feedback to Children's Media Foundation if you think there are issues which are not being addressed. Um, and to keep the conversation going about the discussions to continue uh, the future of public service, television, media, um, conversations, spaces, whatever we want to call it, um, for, for young people in Britain. Um, and really, for, last of all, I want to thank uh, all of uh, the speakers. So on my screen, you've probably see, seen people in a completely different way, such as Zoom. We've got Warren, Rebecca, Katie, Jaffet, and Jane, thank you so much for all your time today. And really thank you to you who's been, who've been taking part and dropping in messages, uh, really appreciate it. And even if you haven't uh, messaged us or haven't had your message read out, do keep in touch with the Children's Media Foundation. Thank you to all of you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>